Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week, I speak to Alan Asperu Guzik, a professor of chemistry and computer science at the University of Toronto, about his work in new materials discovery with machine learning and building a fully automated materials lab that can synthesize molecules discovered in a computer. Alan's work has applications in everything from healthcare to combating climate change. I hope you find the conversation as amazing as I did. Can you give an introduction of who you are and how you got to where you are in machine learning, where you did your education, how you got to Canada? Okay, yeah. so a little bit of a background. My name is Alana Spurugusik. I'm a professor of chemistry and computer science at the University of Toronto, and also a faculty member at the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. I am a US citizen. I grew up in Mexico. I did my PhD in California, and then I became a faculty member at Harvard University from 2006 to 2018 where I decided that I wanted to change countries and I found this wonderful country to the north called Canada, where I've been working at ever since. I just have to interrupt for a second. Why did you move? I moved basically kind of looking ahead what was going to happen in the United States after the election of Donald Trump. I was very concerned about the future of the country and I didn't want my kids to grow up in such a divided environment. So I was thinking of moving to places like Australia or Scandinavia or more civilized kind of societies. And it turns out that I was, in some sense, previewing what happened. And in some sense, I feel vindicated because I imagined something terrible could happen and I wanted to get out. And unfortunately, now I think my dreams came true. Yeah, your nightmares came true. My straight. nightmares came true, yeah. My nightmares came true. I just had a conversation with someone who was talking about the genealogy of artificial intelligence in the United States and how so much of it can be traced back to Toronto. Uh, and I was pointing out that the reason for that is Jeffrey Hinton, largely Jeffrey Hinton, who left Pittsburgh because he didn't want to be beholden to DARPA funding. So it's ironic Canada has really benefited from the politics of the United States. So tell me about new materials discovery and the AI advantage. If you want to think about how AI is impacting the world, you think about technologies where we don't even think about it. For example, face recognition in Facebook or product prediction. I Google a certain product and somehow I'm advertised by all angles to buy such a product. But AI is more and more entering the stuff around us. It's a huge part of the economy. What you use every day, the coatings on all the plastics that you're touching, the structural materials that I'm sitting on this table, the iron and the alloys that are used in all these different industrial components, everything has to do with materials. So the question is, can AI help in improving our physical environment in, in the context of materials and molecules. And that's one of the fascinating questions that I've been working on. And specifically, you've been working on climate change and energy. There were five or six domains that I've seen you reference. I'm very interested in materials that could help society tackle some of the biggest challenges in the world. So currently, I'm working on discovering small molecule drugs for coronavirus treatment, as many people are doing in the world. I'm one of many that are using the computer and AI to try to discover molecules. So I'm always very interested in applications that could save humanity. If we see the immediate threat of climate change, what we need is finding new materials in several classes of energy technologies, energy generation, and energy storage, that could potentially lower the cost or increase the performance of such systems. So my, my career started by listening to David King, which was the science advisor to Tony Blair. When I was at UC Berkeley, around 2005 or 2004, he came in and he told us about the dangers of climate change and how the coast of the UK were going to be so affected by it and how it's very hard to generate renewable energy in such an island country. And it really fascinated me. And then I started thinking about uh, solar cells made of plastic. That was my first real obsession. 
called organic photovoltaics. So it worked a lot on figuring out what would be the best molecules that you use to try to make solar cells out of plastic. And I published a paper on that topic. So I've been working on that, I would say, for 14 years on and off. Solar cells. Solar cells made of plastics are done at very low temperatures, coating this material in a very, very thin layer. What is really interesting about them is that the chemical space to explore is so large, the possibilities of how to blend the molecules are so large, that we have found very good candidates for low-performance solar cells, flexible low-performance solar cells, but not many in high performance solar cells. And the question is how to increase the performance in the lifetime. And uh, they're very exciting because you can replace a lot of the things that are done with metals or with other technologies such as silicon or with plastics, which are very easy to make and manufacture, scalable. That was one of the first topics I worked on. Together with Mike Assistant one Harvard, when I was there, we were thinking about how to replace metals in batteries. All the batteries that you use in the world practically are using metals. Lithium batteries, uh, magnesium, uh, manganese, uh, whatever. There's all sorts of different metals that are used in batteries. And how come you don't have batteries that are just made of organic molecules? So we did start a field called organic flow batteries around, I would say, six years ago, five years ago, when we started thinking about our bodies and biological systems. They use all the time molecules for electron transport. Can we try to use those molecules as replacements? Yeah, I understand the concept of flow batteries on a very large scale where you have tanks of water and and that sort of thing. Can can you talk about how you develop this um, new material that could allow a flow battery in a very small space? Flow batteries are optimized for dollars per kilowatt hour, which is the unit of energy stored, not necessarily for the volume. So the way we think about them is the water-soluble molecules and large scale is probably the best application, not necessarily for your cell phone or your electronic devices. So that would be very challenging because the lithium batteries, for example, are extremely energy density efficient. So the number of electrons per unit volume is very high and per weight, which is the most important thing. So in the case of, of the flow batteries for water, we're more interested in the cost per electron stored. Because if you want to store massively, right, then that's what matters. The way you want to think about molecular space is a little bit like Borges' infinite library, right? He had this beautiful literary analogy of this library of infinite possibilities. Well, making molecules is the same. You can just take a molecule and just make a tiny modification to it. You change a Lego piece by another, and then the molecule will change dramatically. And the practical chemical space we can reach is actually larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So a huge number of potential molecules you could make. So it's basically a fantastic place to study because that means that for whatever chemical problem you have at hand, you could go into the vast chemical space and look at possible combinations of the atoms arrangements and see if what you're looking for is a good candidate, right? The prototype of this is, of course, drug discovery, where very small modifications to a molecule can make it a much more potent drug and it is small chemical modifications that can make a big difference when you're thinking about applications. Imagine a plastic coating that kills COVID-19, right? You can dope it with nanoparticles at the right concentration, and you get, say, twice or better time scale of the depth of the virus in the surface. That would be fantastic because that means that we could pick that material and coat all kinds of places like handrails. What's the best way of doing that with AI so that I don't have to test a thousand molecules, maybe I only need to test a hundred? And it is a factor of 10 that I really care about. 100, 1,000 to 100 or 10 to 1. So I'm not asking for too much. I'm asking just for a factor of 10 in the speed up of the discovery of molecules and materials because I think that would be huge for society. Yeah. And can you describe that process? Do you start looking at corollaries that have properties that you want to find in other molecules? The way it works is we know something called structure property relations to the computer. We can calculate if you give me a molecular structure, what is going to be its function or its property that I care about. For example, I worked a lot in organic molecules for cell phone displays. So there you care basically that the molecule is bright or in a certain color. So let's say you want a very blue molecule that emits light very fast, right? Very bright molecule. So chemical space is infinite. You want to then limit yourself to the regions of molecules that look more or less what we know works in the cell phone space. And then use your computer and AI to look at the possible permutations of molecules in the space and find out which of those molecules 
with a certain permutation has the highest emission of light and the color that you wanted. Say it was a particular blue. So once that happens, then you actually have to go and physically instantiate this because that was only in the computer. You actually have to build it. And I found out that my biggest problem in my career was that building it. But now you have a robot and you actually can use that robot to make the molecules faster. So to incorporate that in the material space as well, make a lot of molecules, the ones that I'm ideating and then testing them a lot with robotics. Because it is the process of ideating them, making them and testing them together that you have to accelerate kind of like a, like a pipeline. And the more you go in towards the application, so we just published a paper with my colleagues at University of British Columbia on coatings in film films. So we built a coating robot that tests the different coating parameters. So that's the total application. So you can imagine a lab that thinks from the computer what molecule to make all the way down to, to actually making the devices that you care about. And it is that kind of pipeline that you want to accelerate here, 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 and here. And on the discovery side, on the simulation side, it begins with some sort of a search function that you're looking for molecules with a certain shape, or, or how do you narrow the search space? We are using tools from machine learning that are called generative models. They try to simulate the probability distribution. So what we've been doing recently is first we run the computer for a bunch of candidates that we care about to generate a sample of uh, molecules that look like the space that we want to search. And we train this machine learning model to reproduce molecules that look like that. And so far, that's weird, right? Like, I mean, give me faces and it will give you faces. And in this case, give me molecules that look like this kind of type of drug molecules or material molecules. It will just give you molecules that look like that. And you will say, yeah, this molecule looks like one of such laser molecules or one of those display molecules or therapeutic molecules or whatever application you care about. But that's not what you really want. What you really want is a molecule that is best at what you're looking for. So we've hooked up another artificial intelligence model, another neural network or a Bayesian Gaussian process model, whatever we're connecting to it. That model, what its goal is, is to actually connect the abstracted representation that the machine learning model learned about this type of molecules to a property in such a way that we can ask the machine learning model, maximize the property and tell me which molecule has such a property. In other words, we conditionally generate from that probability distribution molecules that have a high probability of being very good at what we want. And that conditional generation is what allows us to do what in chemistry we like to call inverse design, which basically means that given a property, we want to find what is the best structure that satisfies its performance. So you create a representation of that property through the neural network, is that right? Yeah, so there's two neural networks, or three, let me call it three, that takes a molecule and converts it into an internal representation. I'm going to call that an encoder. It encodes the molecular structure into something that I like to call the latent space. There's a decoder that can take from that space back to a molecular structure. So if you only had those two neural networks, you can encode and decode back and forth. Then you create a third neural network that maps to that encoded space and takes molecules from that encoded space to properties. The way you do it is you, you take a molecule that you know its property, you encode it and look at where it fell in that latent space. And then you take that point of the latent space and, and correlate it with a particular performance metric. And if you do that for say a few thousand molecules, now suddenly you have yourself a map of which regions of latent space are good for certain properties. And then you use a computer to go to those regions and fish out molecules that could potentially be good for your application. So this encoder, decoder, and now this structure property neural network, the three of them together. So that's what's the cool thing about neural networks and, and machine learning. They are really these toolkits that you can just connect to do the very interesting things. So there's not too many principles that you kind of mix and match. Yeah. And then once this network of neural networks has surfaced molecules that may have this property, these are not necessarily molecules that exist in nature. These could be new molecules. Is that right? That's correct. There will be molecules that more or less look like the ones that are in nature, right? But most likely what this technology will give you is a molecule that has not been made before. And here's where comes the next part of AI that we're working on, which is how to make it. It's a fascinating problem. 
So we're working also on the AI of how to make the molecule, the constraints of our robots, because we want to make sure that our robots can make it. So usually we search spaces that the robots can make, and then whatever comes out is something makeable by our robots. And what would be an example of a molecule that you could make with a robot and one that you could not make with a robot? Robots are very stupid chemists okay, at the moment. They can only do a trick very well. So we have a, a robot in our lab that we're training to run one single reaction. It's called the Mida Boronate Suzuki coupling, a single reaction. But it's a very important reaction because it connects the right fragments and you couple them this way. What is nice is that imagine that your molecule that you're coupling has also a cap that you can remove automatically with a robot and that cap becomes active and then you can couple to it another new molecule. So you can make this sequential synthesizer for families of molecules that you care about. That approach obviously doesn't reach the entire chemical space, but allows you to run things in the robot. So if you think like a traditional chemist, what will happen to you is that you will come up with those exotic reactions, very different reactions, and you will get to many more molecules than us, but then you will have to do it by hand because this reaction requires this and this reaction requires that. Whereas in our case, we want a very dumb robot that knows how to do something extremely well. But then our AI and everything else around it is adapted. But we still, in our case, we, with about a thousand fragments, we can reach about 100 million molecules in chemical space, which is tiny compared to the size of chemical space, but we can certainly start like that. And then you presumably, over time, could build robots that were very good and precise at other tasks. Yeah. Yeah. There is a friend of mine, a very creative scientist. His name is Lee Cronin in the University of Glasgow. He's trying to make this universal synthesizer that requires more and more elements that the chemist used, like, you know, for say, phase separation and for dosing and for this and that, that will allow him to actually automate more and more of the chemistry. And he's halfway there and we collaborate with each other a lot. And I think he, he might be quite successful in almost getting there. And, and then is the ambition to put this chain together into a single platform so that you could at one end identify the properties that you want to find a molecule for and let the nets run and then instruct the robot to synthesize these molecules over and over and then there would be a testing uh, module that would test them and you would just let it run day and night is is that am i oversimplifying it no you're saying exactly right that's my dream and that's what we're getting towards and other people like andy cooper at the university of liverpool have already had systems that do this for catalysis and my friend benji marujama in the air force research lab has done this for carbon nanotubes. So there's a lot of people in the world that have already set this up for particular systems. I want to make these Matthias acceleration platforms as broad as possible, as applicable as possible, so that we accelerate science itself. Because I like to say the world has no time. Just think about just what's happening to us right now, again, in the healthcare sector. So we need to have this capability of, of rapidly generating new molecules and materials for everything. And the next one will be climate change. And things, things that I'm thinking about now, I started talking to, to some folks at different organizations about the, the big problem of fabrics. All these fabrics that we're wearing are um, synthetic fabrics that pollute our riverways and then pollute our oceans. So we might have to go back to biofabrics. So we might want to come up with fabrics that degrade very quickly. But the clothing industry is right now a big, big polluter that we haven't even thought about too much. Specifically on climate change, can you talk some of the material needs there? You mentioned carbon nanotubes for carbon recapture, but are there other things that, that you can think of? Yeah, for climate change, there are a few things uh, that we want to think about. First, I mean, my dream of organic photovoltaics hasn't stopped. Solar cells made of non-silicon materials promise to be very inexpensive and flexible. So... I just published a paper with my friend and colleague, Christoph Brabeck. And I keep mentioning friends and colleagues because really science is all about a lot of us. And I'm mentioning mostly the principal investigators, really the us is the grad students and postdocs and undergraduates that are doing all this fantastic work. But in this case, the group of Christoph Brabeck and our group, we're looking at quaternary blends, which means blends of more than four materials to try to explore quickly the space of them to find out if in that blend of four materials, we could find a good long-lived 
inexpensive solar cell. So that's energy capture. Energy storage is this idea of using, I would say, molecules as the electron storage and release material. That's one case in the flow batteries. Many, many people, and I do a little bit on it, but many other people, like my colleague Ted Sargent at the University of Toronto, are very heavily involved in what is called solar fuels, the conversion of light and CO2 into, for example, ethanol or some molecule that we care about. As a matter of fact, my colleague Jeff Austin, actually, which invented some of those early uh, prototypes, and he's one of the leaders uh, in, in this CO2 conversion, received in the mail a bottle from a New York company that takes CO2 from the air and makes vodka. It's called Earth Vodka, and he has the Earth Vodka bottle there, and we promised to each other just before the coronavirus crisis, I'm going to drink that air Vodka. It's kind of eerie, but kind of cool that you can convert the air into that liquid. So I'm looking forward to getting uh, a little bit tipsy with my friend, uh, Jeff. So that's important because you could, in principle, just take CO2 from the air and convert it into a fuel that you can burn again in a car. Think about the beautiful world that be, the world. And there's also, of course, all the coatings that will go into fusion reactors, all the materials that go into the windmills that could be lightweight and stronger and longer lived, and et cetera. So... All the different components that go into all these energy technologies could be improved in the material side. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fascinating. And where do you stand going back to the Methuselah battery? Where does that stand now? So yeah, before I left Harvard, my collaborators had this beautiful discovery of a molecule that lasts a very long time. We name it like that, as you know, from the biblical reference. And we'll already solve one of the sides of the organic flow battery problem. It requires two sides, one to store electrons, one to that has high potential and one has low potential. And you in discharge mode, you take molecules from one to the other. And in charge mode, you, you put them back into the original one. So we have one side, the low potential side of race solved. The high potential side is very hard because the molecules are more unstable. That probably will take the team another five years or so, just predicting roughly, to get to a molecule that could really work on that side as well. And then you have two molecules that will be extremely expensive. Is that slower fast? It's quite fast for most of the energy technologies in the world. It has taken a long time to take them off the ground. And just by the speed of that project that I started thinking about uh, this automation and how to think about making things faster. But where does it stand? My colleagues at Harvard keep going. I decided to continue working on the space, but not compete with them. So we invented a new molecular class that in my lab that we're exploring. We're having solubility issues. It's not as soluble as we thought, but let's see. So we have another thing on our back, potentially a new, a new class of molecules that we're doing now at Toronto. For other groups around the world, now not only the Harvard team, but many, many other teams around the world are making already flow batteries, so now it's a field. So that's the cool thing about science. When a new idea comes out, right, it just flourishes. Yeah. So far, the automated lab that you have is a test lab. What would it take to put that into production so that you have the platform that, as you said, that is general enough that, that people all over the world could use them? It will never be one platform to make all materials, but you can imagine a map, a materials acceleration platform for a particular class of materials. One that is making structural polymers, one that is making uh, organic molecules, one that is making alloys, one that is making coatings, etc. So what I imagine is one day having this center or facility where we have 10, 15, 20 of them, and we have staff members that know how to use them. And because we can combine them in an intelligent way, we can pump out a lot of applications. As a matter of fact, that dream I can disclose to you is something that I call now the Matthias Acceleration Consortium, which is a consortium because I like to say that industry should be involved, the government should be involved, the national laboratory should be involved, the university, the startups, acceleration, basically any kind of partner that makes sense to involve. And this consortium has a moonshot, which is accelerated discovery of Matthias by a factor of 10. And one of the things that we've been missing the last few weeks is just putting a proposal for that so that we can start getting started in Toronto, but also in Canada. We have many collaborators in British Columbia, for example, and other places of Canada. And also, of course, in the world. I've been mentioning to you some of my international collaborators, including the country I grew up, Mexico, that is working with us on the flow batteries. So I would like to say this is a global thing, and that's why I like to call it the acceleration consortium. And that's the dream going back to your, the vision that you're thinking. It will be a room full of these maps 
full of these young people with energy and hope, which in turn are coming up with some of my dreams. For example, a recyclable sneaker. I'm a runner. I would love to have a sneaker that I just throw away in the landfill and I know the entire sneaker will be biodegradable, actually. So imagine that. I just take the sneaker, I throw it away into, into the landfill. I don't worry about it. I, I think that's a world that probably you want to live in, I want to live in, and many, many people that are responsible want to live in. That's it for this week's episode. I want to thank Alan for his time. If you want to know more about what we talked about today, you can find a transcript of this episode on our website, ionai, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. The transcript is scrolling with speed controls so you can run through it quickly. And remember, the singularity may not be near, But AI is about to change your world, so pay attention.